Join us for the Living the Life broadcast on our series, Understanding the Goodness of God with Dr. Chooks Ugohe. Good evening. Welcome to Understanding the Goodness of God. I am Dr. Chucks Ugohe. Um, tonight is episode 295, 295. And we, we are on the fifth installment of the question and answer series on the goodness of God. Tonight is part five. We have been sh you know, answering questions that have come in since we have been you know, teaching this whole thing about the goodness of God. Uh, tonight I have a few more questions to take. Um, let's begin. If God is good, that's question number one for tonight. If God is good, why does he appear to be absent or silent in times of personal crisis? If God is good, why does he appear to be silent or absent in times of personal crisis? You know, for me to answer this question, I want to refer us to a story in the, in the, in the Bible. In John chapter 11, Jesus had a, a few friends, a family friend. Um, there were two sisters and a brother. The two sisters are Mary, Martha, and their brother is called Lazarus. And Jesus had a good relationship with this family. We don't know, you know, the whereabouts of their parents. The Bible doesn't tell us much about their parents. But the three of them were siblings. And Jesus was their friend. And then, you know, Lazarus became sick. And when he, he, his sickness worsened, his sisters were afraid that he was going to die. So they sent a message to Jesus Maybe they sent messengers to Jesus and they came to where Jesus was and delivered the message and said to Jesus, your friend whom you love is sick. He's sick. Please come and pray for him. And the Bible said when Jesus heard uh, their request, he stayed even two days more. He stayed some time more and he delayed going. When he loved them, he delayed going. So, his disciples were like, ah, if, if he's, if he's, uh, then, no, no, no. So the story goes that he, he delayed going. Then after some time, he said, okay, let's go, guys, let's go. Lazarus, you know, is, is, is sleeping. Let's go. Let's go and wake him up. So the disciples were saying, but if he's sleeping, it doesn't require us to go there. He will wake up. He will wake up. There's no need for us to go and wake somebody who's sleeping. He will wake up by himself. And Jesus had to speak in, to them in plain language, Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad that he, he I was not there. So, so you ask the question, remember that Jesus is a reflection of, of the Father. Jesus, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. So, so this is a, a typical example of a situation where it seemed as if God did not care when people were in personal crisis. Why was that so? Now, there are a number of, when we look at the story, there are a number of things we can learn from the story. Jesus eventually came, and when he came, the sister said, but if you had come when we called you, our brother would not have died. If you had come when we called you, our brother would not have died. So, so they, basically, they were saying, you came late, and it's because of your lateness that our brother died. In other words, you killed our brother. And um, Jesus said to them, there's no need to go on with that. You know, I, I, I am the resurrection. I am the life. I will, I will make it good. I will, I will make it good. And they said, no, uh, we believe that you can raise the, him from the dead. That's what one of the sisters said. And when they asked, Jesus asked him her directly, do you believe? We saw that her faith was not even strong enough to believe God for the resurrection of her brother. Uh, the point is, Jesus delayed intentionally and did not show up. Why did he delay intentionally? He wanted this family to experience something that they didn't know before. They, they, he wanted them to experience something that he did, they didn't know before. Sometimes when, when there is a delay or a seeming delay, there's something God is working out. God is wanting to teach us something through the delay. You see, they, they, what did they want? What did he want them to learn? Number one, that he was able to raise the, the dead. 
He was able to raise the dead. He is the resurrection and the life. He wanted them to experience him as the resurrection and the life. He wanted them, them to experience him as the one who makes an impossible situation possible. So sometimes when there is a delay, God is, there is actually a higher purpose. There is something bigger that is at play. There is something bigger that is working out there. When there is a delay. And this is why when we are strongly rooted in our belief about the goodness of God, we don't get angry at God. We don't get angry. We don't get off, off frustrated that we start, you know, um, um, blaming God. No, no, no. We believe in his goodness. And when we call him and he takes his time to answer, we know he's working out something bigger and better for us. See, if Jesus came the first time they called him, he would have given them healing. Lazarus would have been healed. But because he delayed, the miracle is now bigger. He gave them resurrection. Now, which one is better? To get a miracle of healing or a miracle of resurrection? Of course, a miracle of resurrection is more sensational. It's, it's a bigger miracle. It's a, a more, more attention-grabbing miracle. And so, God wanted to give them a bigger breakthrough. That was why Jesus delayed. And God wanted to teach them and help their faith to believe for the impossible for next time. Because, see... If they saw Jesus just raise their brother from a sick bed, they will never know that Jesus can raise somebody from the dead who has been dead for four days. They will never believe it. So, so he wanted to, to stretch their faith to the next level. So sometimes delays are for us to be stretched to the next level if only we can continue to believe. You see, when delay is there, the enemy is also at work. And I must say this, the enemy is trying to work through the situation to steal your faith, to ground your faith, to destroy your faith, to make you get angry with God and say some horrible things or think horrible things about your father. That's what the enemy is doing. He's testing, he's, he's, pushing, he's pushing his luck with you so that you can, you know, fall out of favor with God because of the things you are saying. However, God, on the other hand, is preparing a bigger miracle. Is preparing a bigger answer. Is preparing a better response, a more miraculous response. So when you have prayed and you are not seeing an uh, seeing an immediate answer, an immediate response from heaven concerning what it is that you are asking from God, don't despair. Don't get frustrated. If you if your faith in the goodness of God is strong, you know that He will come through. A man of God put it this way. He said, when faith in God is absolute, the result is inevitable. When it's only faith that is not absolute, that is not guaranteed. Absolute faith is guaranteed to produce result. Let me say that again. Absolute faith is guaranteed to produce result. Absolute faith that is unwavering. Faith that is unshaken. Faith that cannot be, you know, uh, negotiated out. Look at Bible says concerning Abraham. Who against hope believed? Against hope, he hoped in God. Against hope, he believed. When, you know, his wife was barren as a young woman, now she's on top of barrenness. She's now very old. The man is very old. Their body is not functioning the way it's supposed to function. Yet, Abraham, against all of those uh, symptoms or signs or evidences, I think evidence is a better word, or against all of these verifiable evidences that are su suggesting that having a baby is an impossibility. Abraham believed God. And guess what? His faith worked. A child was conceived when he was 99 years old. And his wife was 90 years old. They conceived a baby. And that promise of God got fulfilled. What's the point we're making here? When there is, seemed to be a delay, there seemed to be a drag, there seemed to be like, you know, things are not coming through. If only you can anchor your faith in an, in an absolute trust in God, that result is inevitable. It will come to pass. It will manifest. You see, your own part is to make sure that the waiting process does not derail your faith. Let me say that again. You have to make sure that the waiting process does not delay your faith. So, so you got to hang in there and 
keep your faith alive. How do you keep your faith alive? You got to speak the word of God. You have to confess the promises of God. You have to declare what God said about you, what God said about the situation. Stay confessing, stay declaring, stay speaking. You know, sometimes our, our faith, you know, drops, our confidence drops, but we use our mouth to help our mind. Let me say that again. You use your mouth to help your mind. You use your mouth to help your mind. You use your mouth to help your mind. Speak the word of God. Speak the promises of God. Speak what you are believing. Confess what you are believing. Call the things that be not as though they were and they will become. Call the things that be not as though they were and they will become. Keep speaking. That's how you deal with delay. You keep speaking the word of God. You keep speaking the promise of God. And guess what? For your shame, you shall receive double. For your shame, you shall. For your weight, there is increased reward. God compensates you for that period of weight. See, for Martha and Mary, God gave them their brother back. Not just healed their brother, but he raised him from the dead. Do you know that a sickness killed Lazarus? So when Jesus raised him from the dead, Jesus automatically healed that sickness and then raised him from the dead. Now, otherwise he would die again from that sickness. If all that was done was to raise him from the dead and the sickness was not dealt with, he would die again. So by Jesus' delay, he got double miracle. He got healing and he got resurrection. He got healing, he got resurrection. If Jesus answered the day they called him, he would have only gotten healing. He wouldn't have resurrection. But God wanted to show them that his power reaches out to raise the dead. So he gave them healing, he gave them resurrection. So if you're facing a personal crisis and it seems like God is silent, or God is quiet, God is not answering, it's okay. Stay with the promise of God, what God said in his word. Stay with that, that's God. Stay with that and keep speaking. Keep declaring. Declaring what God said about your situation. This is why you need to know your Bible. This is why you need to go there and find that scripture that promises you what it is that you are believing for and stay with that word. Keep com confessing that word. Bible says heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God will not drop to the ground. It will not, you will not fail. So you keep speaking it. Keep speaking it. That's how you, you overcome the tiredness and the fatigue of waiting. All right, let me go to the second question. How can a good God allow some people to suffer from the consequences of their own poor choices? Oh, oh, oh. So you want God to keep them from their poor choices. Well, God can. God can. And the, the aspect of God that allows him to, to hold people back from the consequence of their poor choices, is his mercy. Is his mercy. So, so the mercy of God can be released for somebody that they don't suffer the consequences of poor choices. The mercy of God, the mercy of God, the mercy of God, the mercy of God. So, if, if they don't reach out for the mercy of God, they are not going to get it. The Bible says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find help to and find grace to help in the time of need. But we should come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy. So there is a boldness required to appear before the throne of grace to draw down mercy for yourself. So mercy is not automatically thrown at people. No, mercy is not automatically thrown at people. We come before the throne of grace to obtain mercy. And to find grace to help in a time of need. We obtain mercy. So we come boldly there to obtain mercy. Mercy will, will keep you from being uh, punished for the consequence of your actions. That's mercy. Mercy will stop the enemy from hijacking a situation of error in your life to destroy you. To destroy your marriage. To destroy your finances. The, no, no. The enemy always wants to do that. But... The mercy of God says no. The mercy of God says no. So the mercy of God keeps the enemy from unleashing his assault, unleashing, you know, all kinds of things that he is known to unleash. The mercy of God. Hallelujah. So God is not allowing people to suffer from the consequences. He's not allow. 
God is not allowing as if he, you know, no, no. This, the, the, the universe has laws. The universe has laws. And when people make poor choices, they will have to face the music of their poor, ex, the music of their poor choices, except if they activate the force of mercy. Except if they activate the law of mercy on their behalf. All right. And those, those who know their God are the ones who know that we can obtain mercy. Amen. Let me leave it there. <laughs> Let me leave it there. Number three. Why did Satan malign the character of God to Adam as his first assault on mankind? Why did Satan malign the character of God to Adam as his, as his first assault on mankind? We remember that in the Garden of Eden, the first time we see the enemy talking to man, well, woman, the female man, woman, he was, he was attacking the character of God. He was attacking the character of God and wanting Adam to believe that God was not a good God. And Adam uh, uh, chose the bait. Adam took the bait. And Adam, you know, believed an error, acted on that error, and man, man fell. Why did he do that? Why did Satan attack the character of God? Why? Because how man, who is made in the image and the likeness of God, how man perceives God determines how he functions. How man perceives God determines the experiences that man will have in the earth. So if Satan, the enemy of God, manages to turn man against God, to make man believe that God is not good, then he will have man where he wants to have him. <laughs> because when your picture of God is not accurate, Satan is the one who benefits from your inaccurate picture. He will assault you. He will attack you. He will. So it's you, it, so Satan. It's in Satan's best interest to keep you from knowing the true character of the God you serve. That's what he wants to do. So so this is why the the first assault on mankind in the Garden of Eden was an attack on the character of God. Do you know that Satan is still doing the same in the heart of people even now as I preach? He wants to malign the character of God in the hearts of God's people. He wants to assassinate the character of God, make people believe that God is not good. So that when they believe it, that God is not good, then God cannot act on their behalf. Not because God doesn't want to, but because there is no faith in the goodness of God to draw God into the same. So, we all have to be careful how Satan maligns the character of God to us. You know, you need to resist him long enough that he knows not to come to you. Not to come to you with lies. You know, uh, or, or, or things about the character of God. He, he, he should know that you know so much about the character of God that he doesn't try. This is what God desires. Amen. Okay, number four. How can a good God allow some people to struggle with guilt or shame over their past mistakes or sins. God is not allowing it. God is not allowing it. Man is doing it. <laughs> I've explained this concept of allow. Part of the problem of a lot of people who are having issues about the goodness of God, about the character of God, is, is, is this word allow. They say God allowed. God allowed. No, God did not allow. <laughs> God did not allow. Man, the earth was given to man. Man sold the earth to the enemy. So Satan is controlling the earth. It's not man. It's not God. Satan is running the show in the earth. It's not God. So when you say allow, he's not allowing it. Man, man makes his choices and has to leave the consequence of his choices. It's not God allowing it. It's, if God's hands is not even in it. Instead, one of the things that God is doing is that he stands on the other end trying to do damage control. Trying to help you reduce your suffering by reason of your error. That's God. Alright, number four. No, no, I've dealt with number four. Number five. Why is it important to study and understand the true nature and character of God? 
Why is it important to study and understand the true nature of and the character of God? Like, listen, the Bible says, he that comes to God must believe that he is. He must believe that he is, that he's a reward of those who diligently seek him. So he that comes to God must believe that he is. You got to believe that he is, that he is a good God. You got to know his character. You must know his character. And guess what? The clearer we, we know his character, the better our life on the earth. The more we perceive him more accurately, the more we manifest the goodness of God in our lives, in, through our lives. So, so it's important to know the true nature of God and the true character of God so that you can believe right, so that you can think right, so that you can reach out to him right, and then you are able to manifest better results. But if you don't know his true character, you will often blame him for things that he's not responsible for, often blame him for things that the Satan is responsible for. But because you don't know the true character of God, you, you ascribe the works of Satan to God. But if you know the true character of God, there are some things you see, you know this is not God. This is the enemy. This is not, no, no, this is not the hand of God. This is the enemy. And then you don't fall for that temptation. All right. We are, we are, we're going to fold it here. I, I think I'm done for tonight. I think I'm done for tonight. If, if you are dealing with guilt and shame, you need to know this, that God forgave you the moment you ask for forgiveness. God forgave you. And there's no point carrying the sin anymore. In fact, with God, there's no record of your sin. With God, there is no record of that sin. If you have repented of it, if you've, you know, renounced that sin, God does not keep a record of it. So, you are the one who is keeping a record. You need to forgive yourself. <laughs> you need to forgive yourself. God is not keeping a record of your sins. So, you need to forgive yourself and move on. Amen. All right. I'm, I'm done. Let's, let's uh, join again tomorrow as we take a few more questions. And I think tomorrow we'll round up the series on question and answer for now, for now. I think we'll pick it up in the future when we have taught a bit more. But if you do have any other questions, we'll love to hear them. We'll love to entertain them. We'll love to take them on. If it's something we need to answer you privately, we will reach out to you privately and answer you. If something we need to discuss in, you know, in a broadcast like this, then we will do so. But tonight, I have you know, delivered something that you can chew on, you can think about, you can call friends, you can uh, share the link and let you know, somebody around you be blessed even as you have been blessed. God bless you. Good night. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. There comes a time in your life when you need a change, an upgrade. You need upliftment. You need lasting results. You just want your life to be real. You need your life to be meaningful, deep, full, purposeful and easy. You're looking for enlargement, amplification, increase, strengthening. You're looking for growth in your life. You want leverage, strategic advantage, gain and favor, ability to influence, clout and strength. Join us at Resurrection Life Church every Sunday. Visit our website .reslife.org.za for more information. Make this year your year of being real. Embrace rapid enlargement and leverage. It is your time.